Thank you, Dr. Clark, for allowing me to be here today and for um, Pastor David and Sherry, I don't know if they're in the room, but hosting and allowing the building to come available for this. I know the sacrifice that is involved in that, and I told him, thank you for the excellence of this house. Uh, I look for excellence when I walk into a building, and I sense excellence here, and there's excellence in everything they do. So praise the Lord. Amen for that. Thank you, pastors, for hosting this event. Wow, thank you, Pastor Matt. That made me feel... I laughed a lot. I always laugh when you talk. I don't know why. It's just amazing that a Methodist is full of the Holy Ghost, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, is, it is an interesting thing. And I know what that's like because I'm Southern Baptist. <laughs> and, and I am thankful for my heritage, my background, all that I was taught as a Southern Baptist. But, you know, a while back, I got hungry for more of God, and I said, nothing that I do in ministry is happening that I read about in the Bible other than people get born again. And I took off my denominational glasses and started to read the Bible. And I started seeing things I've never seen before. And these lenses were very expensive. Yeah. But it, it's been worth it. How many Baptists in the room at one time, or if you're practicing Baptist, raise God. Oh, you look wonderful. I tell people they're more Baptists than people. <laughs> Everywhere I go, there's like 75% of Pentecostal tongue-talking churches are now filled with Baptists. And I, yeah, I, I love it. So it's good. It's great to be here. I, I just want to uh, take just a few moments, let you know there is... Uh, as Pastor Matt said, a move of God happening in Dawsonville. It is a move, not the only move of God, the only portal that God is moving around the world, but uh, there is something special happening in Dawsonville. And Dawsonville, you, you've never heard of it, maybe, perhaps. Uh, we're known for a few things. We're known for NASCAR racing. We're known for having the Appalachian Trail start in our county. And we're known for moonshine. I kid you not. That's what we're, we're moon, that's the moonshine place. Yeah. And, uh, and isn't it interesting that the Lord, you know, moonshine's called hooch. It's called Mountain Dew. Y'all help me out. Some of you are licking your lips like I'm backsliding in church. But it's also called fire water. And our city's about 3,000 people. Our county's about 30,000, so it's really small. It's 50 miles from downtown Atlanta. You can get there in about an hour. But isn't it interesting that the Lord gave me a vision in January of 2018 in a time of fasting and prayer with our congregation that I had an open vision, and I saw our baptistry that was empty, no water in it, but for 8 to 10 seconds, I saw it full of water, and a strip of fire on top of the water that was two and a half to three feet wide and from front to back, and it vanished. And I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me, and he says, Todd, I'm going to baptize people with Holy Spirit fire. Now, I'm Baptist. I understand baptism. Baptist baptism. And I understood that new believers got born again. But I took on a new understanding when I started watching people get into the waters with all types of issues and sicknesses and addictions, encounter the Lord in a way I've never seen before in my life. So there is a new fire water in Dawsonville, Georgia. Yeah, praise the Lord. I, I want to I talk to you just a little bit in our time that I have in a few moments. Uh, I want to tell you some stories. Then I want to tell you how it happened and how it can happen in your church. I want to show you an image of a lady of, who, came to, who came to Dawsonville. I don't know if we can flip that switch if it's good. This lady right here, um, her name's Lorraine. And she's from Brunswick, Georgia, five and a half hours away from Dawsonville on the East Coast down there on the, on, on the ocean. 
and she was in a um, oncologist's um, doctor's office, if you will. She had been diagnosed with stage four breast cancer. She's on Facebook and she started hearing and reading, I should say, and listening to some testimonies of people who traveled to this little out of the way church, small church, small town, and started hearing about people getting healed in the water. So she's in the oncologist department or oncologist office getting ready to get another test about the cancer that's spreading through her body. She heard about it and she told her husband, John, who was the state school superintendent in the state of Georgia, and said, I need to travel to this little church because I hear that the Lord's touching people in the water and I'm dying. Well, for those of you who don't know what stage four breast cancer looks like, it looks like this in the human body. Those are 50 cancerous lesions in her body. She said, we stopped counting at 50. Every dark spot on that image is cancer that has been metastasized and spread into her uh, uh, lymph nodes, her bones, her organs. And when she was diagnosed in June of 2018, she told the doctor, I am not taking radiation and chemo. I'm interested in quality of life rather than, um, than being sick all the time. I want you to take a look at that one more time because it's, it's very Im important for you to notice. So she decided to take the oral route, if you will. She was just going to take pills. And in this meantime, she heard about what's going on in Dawsonville. And she had taken four pills. She gets into the water this particular night, her and her husband, dying, maybe perhaps a year to live at best, and she encounters the Lord in the water. Now, her husband's looking at her like something's not really good going on here, but what had happened is the presence of the Lord sat down upon her. And as Pastor Matt said a few moments ago, she's out in the spirit and cannot find her feet. And so she's floating. So we escort her to around the side because we can baptize around uh, three or four or five people at a time in our pool. We can put about eight people in our pool at a time. And while she's out, Dr. Clark, she hears the Lord sing a song over her. And she told me, now Pastor Todd, it wasn't a Christian song. <laughs> and I'm going, wait, wait, I need to check this out. Because if it's not Elevation, Bethel, Maverick City, it can't be. You know, it's got to be one of those. And she said, while I'm out for 30 minutes, and we just had someone hold her and pray silently over her while she's in, floating in this water. And the words that she heard from the Lord in the song was, may I have this dance with you. She gets up out of that water and she notices there's no more pain in her body and she can move her neck from side to side. She goes the very next day, the very next day, to have another PET scan done. And this is the result. That's her bladder, her kidneys, and her heart. In one moment, one encounter. She goes from that to this. And the only difference, yeah, praise him. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Blessed be your holy name. And the only difference is who she met in the water. Pastor Matt's correct. Over 27,000 people have have been in our baptismal waters in the last 226 weeks. We baptized another 25 to 30,000 people outside the walls of our church and other ministries and other places. And everything that happens in Dawsonville happens to those places we go to. There are pastors in this room that could testify of God meeting people in the water. Now, can he meet people at the altar? Absolutely. Can he meet them in a tunnel of fire? Absolutely. Again, this is just one portal of glory. Uh, that we are experiencing, but I have never seen the potency of the power of God like I have witnessed in water. 
I've not seen dozens of miracles, hundreds of miracles. I've seen thousands of miracles. And people ask me all the time, why water? Why is he choosing water? I, and I don't, I'm not a, a theologian where I can answer that. I know about the mikvah. I know the power of the immersions. I know all about that. But perhaps the Lord is trying to do something in the Western church using water that he's not been able to do from the pulpit. And I love the pulpit. I'm a preacher. But it seems like we have taken the pulpit and made it about our personality. And he's doing in water what cannot be done, perhaps, or is being done from the platform because we made it about productions. And literally lights and lasers and things like that. This water right here is going to be very hard to contaminate and mess up. And it is a completely nameless and faceless move of God that is very difficult to hijack. And the Lord always told me, he said, Todd, if you'll never touch it, and if you'll keep your fingers off of it, he says, I'll stay and fire will be on this water. I'm sitting outside of the pool. And a girl gets into the water because we always ask four questions when a candidate gets in there. What's your name? Where are you from? And why are you in the water? She walks to the front. I'm on the outside and I'm, I'm listening to her story. She says her name and she says, I'm 17. I'm addicted to meth and I cut myself. Well, here's an image of her arm that I see outside the baptismal. This picture was taken one week prior to her immersion. And she came and she held up her arm and I'm two feet from her and I, and I slide closer to her and I, I literally look at that and my wife's there and our team's in the water and she says, I harm myself. I cut myself. Pastor Marty, our executive pastor who does a lot of the immersions in one of our pools, he just took her arm and anointed it with oil and baptized her. Now, you have to understand, I was raised Baptist. I'm against everything. <laughs> I am a skeptic and cynical. That's why we want pictures Tell me you're healed, but tell me what it was like before. Do you have a document that proves that? Because we've all been scammed before. I'm not interested in the temporary healing that lasts while you're under the anointing of the bill. I want to know three weeks from now, are you still walking in that healing? That's why we try to document. I got stacks of this thick, just literally of documented miracles of before and afters. I watch with my very own, these Baptist eyes, with my very own eyes, she comes up out of the water and I watch these scars disappear by 50% with my own eyes. Pastor Marty looks at her and he kind of smiles and grins and he says, you know, I just know what Jesus would do if he was here. He took that anointing oil, rubbed her arm one more time, dunked her the second time and she comes up. And I'm telling you, I watch with my own eyes. Now watch this, my Baptist wife, which is IFB, Independent Fundamental Baptist, with her, I'm married to that. I mean, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Unbelievable. But when they get it, and we watch with our own eyes, this girl's arms go from this right here to literally, I took this picture after her immersion with my own camera. Come on, give him glory. Give him glory. Give him glory. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I'm in Titusville, Florida. I want to introduce you to this lady right here for just a moment. I'm in Titusville, Florida. Just notice what they're getting baptized in. Just horse troughs, uh, saunas, uh, we just had a meeting, a pastor in Alabama in a swimming pool, hotel swimming pool lined up. Can you imagine taking over a swimming pool for immersions and people getting healed? I'll never forget, we were at the mall, uh, the National Mall at the Tent of David, and we set up an above-ground swimming pool. People came from everywhere. Senators were coming, and, and they were, what are y'all doing? Well, we're just immersing people to get closer to Jesus. And they'll go, well, I want to be baptized. Yeah. And so she's getting, she's baptized, if you will. Now, just look at that, 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 that tank right there. I mean, that's, 
they didn't even take the price tag off of it. We have pastors that will go to the tractor supply place and they say, hey, can we borrow this tank? What you need it for? Well, we're going to baptize some people. I mean, it's rusty. It's just nasty. So Kathy comes to the meeting in Titusville, Florida at Roger Hackenberg's church there. And she has stage four leukemia. She's dying. She's dying. So in September of 2020, she comes to the meeting. She gets into the water on Monday night and she goes up under and nothing physically happens to her. So she comes back on Tuesday nights because we immerse for two nights. She comes back on Tuesday night. She's the first one in line. She gets immersed and nothing happens. Now, for most of us, our theology teaches us to ask in faith. And if it doesn't happen, just accept it. It must be God's will that you're going to die. But she kept pursuing because she knew what Jesus would do if he was standing in front of her in his physical bone body. He kept knock she kept knocking. And she kept pursuing. So I went back 30 days later. Guess who's in the building? She had lost 50 pounds. The doctors were concerned it spread to the rest of her body. She's sitting on the fourth row wrapped in a block, uh, blanket. They call her Tigger because when she worships, she dances. But on this particular night, she's so sick that she can't even dance. And she's freezing because she has no more fat on her body. But the first one in the pool that night... You guess it, it's her. Not her first immersion, not her second immersion, but her third one. She comes up out of that water, no pain in her body, physically revigorated, invigorated I should say, and gets dressed and begins to serve people getting into the baptismal waters by handing them towels. She goes the next day to get an update on her test and report. She gets a call from the oncologist on her way to church on Tuesday. She said, uh, the oncologist said, Miss Kathy, um, we, 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 we would really like for you to come back tomorrow to take another test because we think our machine is broken. She said, okay, I'll be there in the morning, but on the way. Now, listen to this. Her diet to this point was some Boost crackers and, and some applesauce. She had lost 50 pounds. On the way to church, she said, honey, I think I've got an appetite. Let's go to Cracker Barrel. <laughs> Feel the Holy Ghost all in that, right? Mm -hmm. Let's go to Cracker Barrel. And so they decided to go to Cracker Barrel. I kid you not. She sent me the email. This, she said, this is what I ordered. I ordered fried catfish, hash brown casseroles, and some pinto beans and some sweet tea. She said, I drank it all and ate it all. And that night served everybody in the water. So she goes to the doctor the next day and they run lab work, took blood, took the test. And, and they call her on Thursday and they said, Miss Kathy, we really have a problem here because we, you do have cancer, right? She said, according to what y'all told me, and I've lost 50 pounds and I can't do anything, but I feel great today. And they said, listen, we don't know what's happened, but we can't find any cancer in your body. <laughs> My Lord, thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So the news of this begins to spread, not only nationally, but internationally. People will come to Dawsonville with, with three weeks to live. And it, it blows our mind to know that people have 21 days to live and they choose to spend one of them yes. with us. That matters. That is significant. I could go on and on and, and tell you story after story and, and one of them is, is this, this precious girl here. Her name is Alexis. That's Pastor Marty and and Alexis came to our women's conference and, and got immersed and the Lord touched her. And I'll read this to you, but you can't. I know you probably can't read it, but Pastor Marty posted this on his Facebook. He said, this is Alexis. I asked her for permission before posting this. 
She got into the baptismal waters last night along with hundreds of other women. She immediately broke when she stepped into the water. She began to weep, then to wail. The Lord touched her in such a beautiful, gentle, redeeming kind of way that he met her in the water. This morning when I took this picture, she began to tell me that as a little girl in elementary school, her mother began trafficking her to an entire organization of men who met on a weekly basis. She said they would fill me full of drugs. She told me that two weeks ago she tried to take her own life just to be done with the daily torment and the shame. But she said last night after I was baptized, I slept with the lights off in a dark room for the first time in over 30 years. She said, I've never slept all through the night without waking up screaming to the top of my lungs and my nose bleeding until last night after the Lord healed me. I can't explain what happens to people when they step into that water. And it's not the water. Just like it's not this altar. This is carpet. This is wood and it's a sacred place. But this altar's never changed a life. But who you meet here is what changes you. And the Lord is just using water in Dawsonville in such a way that people will come and wait sometimes 12 hours, 12 hours to meet him in the water. They'll get there at four and leave at five in the morning. I can't explain what people encounter. It's different with every individual. Sometimes we have to stack them up like cordwood. When we were in Seoul, South Korea, he met them there. Martinsville, Indiana, he met them there. Anaheim, California, largest indoor above swimming inside of a sanctuary. We baptized a thousand people and he met them there. And then he met him. We've taken over a million point two photographs in four years. We document everything, everything, every candidate matters. Every person matters. Why are you, what's your name? My name's Alex. Where are you from? I'm from Atlanta. Why are you in the water? I'm a homosexual and I want to be free. Pat Schatzlein's in that picture there. You'll see him, I think, on the far left. Many of you may know him. He's an evangelist. My, one of my elders is on the right, but Alex gets into the water. And we baptized him the first time, and we thought that would be it. But when he was coming up out of the water, the whole area filled up with an, 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 an odor that wasn't there prior to his immersion. I smelled it. Pat smelled it. And we looked at one another. I said, dunk him again. Because I mean, how many of y'all know sometimes you've got a dirty spot on you, it takes more than one application of a rag and soap on it. Talk to me now. So we baptize him the second time. He comes up out of the water and the odor intensifies. I said, Pat, dunk him again. Took him under the third time. He comes up out of the water and this is the moment that they captured of when he shouts, I am free. Come on, give God glory. And I kid you not, the odor literally disappears. So what was happening in this situation, that sexual spirit, the unclean spirit, was having a confrontation inside of his being of a perverted, unclean spirit meeting the Holy Spirit. 
And what the Holy Spirit was doing and what we see in the waters time and time again, thousands of times, there is a conflict, there is a confrontation that takes place of the Holy Spirit coming into and ejecting the, ejecting the trespasser, yeah. evicting the squatter in their life. As soon as he says, I'm a homosexual and I want to be free, the Holy Spirit went, okay, that's all I needed. I can't explain to you what this means to me. I'm in Middlefield, Ohio, in Amish territory. They just went and bought three or four uh, whirlpools and started dunking people. What's your name? He says it. Where are you from? I'm from Middlefield. And this 10-year-old boy, why are you in the water? I just want more of Jesus. And our Father, who loves us so much, just sat upon him. I can't explain what all happens to people. They get into the water. So much happening here. The hands that are about to be placed upon him. The movement of the water. A grave, if you will. The one that's going to catch him in the water and then the child above his shoulder waiting his turn. I think what the Lord's doing in this nation and around the world with water is significant. Because no man can get any of the accolades. It is an encounter with a loving Savior that wants to reach down deep on the inside of all of us and remove everything and every hindrance in our life. People say, Todd, how did this happen? Can I just be transparent with you? You're looking at a pastor that was so discouraged, so frustrated, so beat up. My church was plateaued. I would add 60 people, lose 63 in a year. Add 100, lose 105. I'm declining. I got a hold of Psalm 27, 8, if you're ready for a Bible verse. And it was King David that said this. Oh God, when you said, seek my face. David said, my heart says back to you, oh God, your face will I seek. And in December of 2017, I'm reading that. And it dawned on me in the middle of being a parent, a husband, a pastor, a con church consultant, all of these things. I, like David, had lost the face of God. I knew him. I loved him. But every time I prayed, I was asking him for something. I was familiar with his hands. I was familiar with his promises. And it wasn't that I was backslidden. David was the most powerful man, the wealthiest man, a psalmist, a songwriter, the leader of Israel. And God had to tap on his heart. Hey, David, would you seek my face again? And he said, oh, God. Your face I will see. So you're looking at a pastor and said, God, I've done it all, but I've lost your face. 
And I said, church, we're going to fast for 21 days, just 21 days. And we're not going to ask him for a thing. We're not going to ask him to bless us financially. We're not going to ask him to heal our bodies. We're not going to ask him to bless our church to cause it to grow. I said, for 21 days, would you meet me here in this sanctuary? And let's do nothing but seek his face. I read John chapter 2 where it said, Jesus turned the water into wine and then he, it says from this point forward, he manifested his glory. And I said, God, whatever you that look like, would you do it in our, our church? This little church that nobody knows about, nobody wants to come to. Nobody wants to be here. No speaker wants to come. But God, would you come and whatever that looked like about your glory, would you do it right here in this little Appalachian town of 3,000 people and 120 to 140 people on a Sunday morning, would you come? And for 21 days, 21 days, we're fasting. We're seeking his face. And in the middle of that, in the middle, in the middle, God visits me with that vision. Fourteen days in, I'm walking across that platform and I see that baptistry empty and, I, and then I see it full of water. And one week later, I resign the church. Had no idea what that fire on the water meant. I just thought it was my new converts were going to have a great encounter with the Lord. I resigned the church. To my executive staff, I said, I'm done. Pat Schatz line calls. He says, I don't know you. I've never seen you. But I think I had a dream about you last night. He says, I saw you in a dark room with your hands up. And on Friday morning before I resigned, I was in a dark room with my hands up. And I said, God, I quit. And the Lord told me to tell you, don't quit. I took that resignation and pulled it back. And for the first time in a long time, I never doubted that he loved me. I just did not know that he knew where I was. And what happened next? Two weeks later, the glory of God falls in our sanctuary. And we started baptizing people spontaneously. People say, Pastor, are you excited about revival? I love revival. But we didn't seek revival. We sought Him. Don't seek healing. Seek the healer. You can capture revival and miss him. You can put together a series of services and miss him. Does that help anybody in the room? I'm just telling you, I'm just being transparent with you. And if God can do it in Todd Smith's life and in Dawsonville, Georgia... He can do it in your life, your ministry, wherever you are. Because I do not believe, and I could be corrected on this, that moves of God are sovereign. I don't believe that. I believe that God wants revival and an awakening in every church. I just don't think he chose just Dawsonville just because we're far, we, have, we have Moonshine Festival every year. I think the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth trying to find somebody's heart is completely loyal to him. And he says, I'll pour out my spirit there and show myself mighty. Does that help you? I just want to encourage you, no matter what you're walking through, no matter what circumstances you're going through, don't quit. Listen, you may be like I was. I'm, listen, I'm literally one dream away from missing a move of God. Don't quit. Don't give up. Well, how have things changed? Everything changes. People say they want revival. It's the most arduous thing in the world that you will walk through. It's the most difficult thing you will encounter. Because with revival comes the responsibility of hosting the Lord. 
I'll never forget this. I'll never forget this as long as I live. We're 11 to 12 weeks into the move of God, Dr. Clark, and, and I'm at the altar, and I'm laying down. I said, God, I'll do whatever you ask me to do. I'll pay whatever price you want me to pay. Whatever you do, don't take your hand, because I'm seeing things I never dreamt of, and I'm witnessing things happen. Right, now, our church didn't grow in the beginning. Literally, for two or three years, it didn't grow. God wanted to check my heart. Are you in it for church growth? Or are you willing to host me so I can touch the nation? People would come to me, you know, good speakers. And they'd come and, you know, they didn't want to come when we were 120 people in revival. They go, man, I bet your church is growing. I go, and I was embarrassed. I go, no, it's not growing. I thought you said you were in revival. No, we lost 300 people. So I'm in the, at the altar. I said, God, they can all walk. I don't care. I have you and don't you ever leave, please, oh God. I said, I'll do anything you ask. I'll pay whatever price. And as soon as I got those words out of my mouth, he said, Todd, you've hurt some people. And then he goes, you hurt your previous elders at the church you were at last. And I kid you not, I said these words back to him as if he was talking to me out loud. I said, Lord, they hurt me. And I think they need to come to me and apologize. I felt the Lord do this. And I'm right here at the, I could take you to the place in Dawsonville. I felt the Lord go just like this. Because I had determined at that moment the level of glory and the weight of glory that I was willing to carry. You see, revival sits on the shoulders of men. And you get to determine the weight you're willing to carry. The more you die and the more broken you become, there's an inversion here. The weaker you are, the greater amount of glory. In my opinion. And when I felt him pull away from me, I said, oh no, Lord. I'll do it. And I hadn't seen these elders in 10 years. Not a one of them. And then they started popping up everywhere. <laughs> I kid you not. And the Lord would, the Lord would point them out to me. They're like, it'd be like that little highlight. Like, you, you know, like little, there's one over there. And I go, no, Lord. I see. <laughs> and watch this. And the Lord says, okay, what are you going to do? And every one of them... I struggled to go because it was humiliating. And I walked alone. Let me say it again. I walked alone. Oh, he, he was here, but he stood here. He gave me strength, but I had to make that right. I remember going to one person and, and I apologized to him. And I said, man, I'm sorry I messed up and I need you to forgive me. I hurt you and I hurt your family. And he said, yeah, you did. He said, what in the world's wrong with you? Now, this is 10 years ago. You've ever gotten the fighting shakes? I mean, think about when you were unsaved. I mean, you wouldn't, the fighting shakes. Well, I got the fighting shakes for about two or three seconds right there. I said, I'm going I'm to kill you right here. You think you got something to be mad at? I'm going to kill you right here. He goes, yeah, what's wrong with you? And then, and then I said, a lot. A lot. And I just need you to forgive me. And then I saw his wife in the car, and I'm laying, I, just, I just leaned in, and I said, I need you to forgive me. And when I apologized, and, and I didn't say if I hurt you. The Lord had already revealed to me that I did that. And when I repented to her, asking nothing in return, and she wept, he weeps. And we made it right with one another in the parking lot. 
At that very instant, the level of glory went to a new place in our congregation. Pastor, let me say this to you. The greatest responsibility of a man of God, as they taught me at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary, they didn't teach me this part, but they taught me, here's what a pastor does. One, preach the gospel. So be a good preacher. They trained me. Two, make disciples. Matthew 28. They gave me curriculum. Number three, win the loss. Took me through evangelism training. Four, love your people and then feed the sheep. And I gave my life to that. But I've discovered something since the glory of God fell in our congregation. I discovered this, that those are not the top priority of a pastor's life. The highest priority of a man of God, in my opinion, and a woman of God, as you lead people, is to host the presence of God in your church. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from the preaching, the making disciples, and the winning the laws, and feeding, and nurturing your people. Those are all top priorities. But the highest thing that I have discovered is to create such a culture and environment in my personal life that God is attracted to it. And then in return, creating a culture in our congregation that God, as T.F. Tenney says, sometimes will come out from behind the curtain and take center stage. And I say, God, I never want you to go back behind the curtain. I want to create such a culture of honor, of prayer, of humility, and brokenness that you never unpack your bags or you never pack your bags to leave this place again. Does that make sense to people in the house? Yes. So pastors, you create that culture. As, uh, Brother Corey was talking about earlier, and Pastor Matt and Dr. Clark and others, that culture of hosting him and hosting him well. So that when you walk into the back door, there's a level of glory that meets you and your people because he is a perpetual presence in your sanctuary. Does that help you? Can I share two or three more stories with you? Then I'm and I'm done. Okay, I want to let me let me do this very quickly because uh, I I don't have time. I um, I'll, I'll show you what this is, Pastor. Can I do this right here? I I'm gonna talk fast. Listen fast. Craig Tony comes to the North Georgia revival from Texas. He gets into the water at his baptism and his immersion service at the immersion service at night. And he says, Pastor, after his immersion, he said, can I meet with you? I go, yeah, I'd be glad to meet with you tomorrow morning. Come and we'll, and we'll talk. He walks into my conference room. My wife's there. His wife's there. And he says, I just want to let you know, when I got in those waters last night, I felt nothing. And when I got out of the waters, I felt nothing. Well, that's the last thing that you want to hear is that, <laughs> that you're like, you're a failure. You know, and he says, I felt nothing. But he said, at 3 o'clock this morning, I was awakened and I was more in love with Jesus at three o'clock in the morning than I have ever been in my life. He says this question. He says to me, he said, Todd, can you come to Texas? I go, yeah. He says, well, we're two and a half hours from Dallas outside of Sulphur Springs. Can you come to da Can you come to Texas? I go, yeah. And then he said this question. He said, well, we're small. I said, I didn't ask you that. Because we never ask that question. Because you know what? There's people just like me that nobody ever wanted to come to. And one man, one woman turned on to God can change a whole city. He says, well, we're tiny. I go, okay. He said, will you come? I'll come. I'll come. I, I go out there, and, and they had this church, which was a truck um, mechanic shop turned into a church. A county judge is there, and then also a, um, the prison ward is there. He says, now we're small. He says, now when, we, when you get there, it's going to be tiny. And, and there are about 20, 28 people. I've, gone, I've, I've got on a plane and, and shown up with seven people. 
to immerse three people. The next day, 25. The next day, 50. And the whole city's turned upside down in that little town right there. Doesn't matter. It doesn't. We never, ever ask the how many question. Now, that's just us. We baptized 100 people in that little town in two days. County judge, the prison ward's there. He said, come back next month. I go back the next month, and I'll tell you what I see when I walk in the door. <laughs> that county judge and that prison, prison warden said, I know these people that got immersed in that water and I've seen what God's done in their life. I've watched the bodies get healed. I watch people with blood pressure issues. I watch people with skin conditions. I've watched people with, with all types of, that we know if God can touch these people, he can certainly touch the prisoners. I kid you not, that baptismal pool is where he told me he said that's where they used to change the oil in the transfer trucks <laughs> these women are getting in the water and we'll ask them the four questions what's your name where you're from and you ought to hear their stories i'm telling you it's not it's not for a church crowd i'm telling you and one lady gets into the water and says, why are you in the water? And she puts her feet in the water and she begins to weep and she begins to cry. Not before her immersion, even before her immersion, the presence of God just begins to settle on her because she's walking into her own grave. Baptism is a burial. And she knows she's three feet away from dying. She said this, she says, I am... I, 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 I'm in prison because of my drug addiction and I love math more than my own children. That was on Friday night. Saturday night, the men show up. I'm immersing a, a, a couple of the men and, and they're lined up on the wall, right? They're all as far as you can see. Now they got the prisoners, the men there, Dr. Clark, because they said they're giving away free pizza. And so if you're a prisoner, you want free food, pizza, dominoes. I noticed this big guy walking in and out of the, uh, of the fellowship hall, little door, and he's eating pizza. I'm in the water, and I see him walking in and out. And the Lord says, tell him I want to I baptize him. And I said, Lord, he's in prison for a reason. So I'm dunking and I'm thinking, you know, the Lord said, because he's going in and out, he said, tell him I want to baptize him. And I said, okay, Lord, it's up to you. And I'm pointing my finger to him. And you know how people do. I, I said, hey, the Lord wants to baptize you. He goes, and he looks at me, I go, I go yeah. Now, now he walks two feet and he puts his hands over his face and he begins to weep. He walks another six feet puts his hands over his face, and he stopped. Now, the whole crowd's watching him, and all the prisoners are, like, gasping. And he's beginning to weep. Well, I did not know that who I called out was a very bad dude. Those two lightning bolts mean something. had no idea that I was calling out someone, very violent, drug runner, a racist, a member of the Aryan nation, and from solitary confinement, controlled four state pens. He could call for the murder of someone in another state and it would be done by the end of the day. I asked him in an interview, I asked him, I said, Big Robert, uh, why did you hate black people? He said, when I was seven years old, I had a red wagon in my front yard and, and, and two, uh, two neighbors, black 
fellows stole the wagon. He said, I've hated black people ever, ever since. I hated them. He said, Todd, you, he told me, he said, you would not believe how many people I shafted in prison, black men, and watched them bleed out. And it turned me on. Now, if I would have known that, thank God he didn't give me the word of knowledge. That would not have been a good thing. Sometimes ignorance is a blessing. He gets to the edge of the water. I'm at the bottom of the tank. Pastor Craig is at the top. We don't have a lot of people in our church. I didn't ask the question. He gets to the top and he spreads his arms like that. And this is what he said. All my life, I've waited for this moment. He gets, I mean, water went everywhere. <laughs> he comes up out of this water, and these are his tattoos. I, I mean, I could show you all the tattoos, Air Nation tattoos. He comes up out of that water, and he begins to weep like a baby. And I hear one word, precious, sobbing and precious. I took the mic, and I said, why are you saying precious? And this is what he mouthed to me. And everybody in the room heard it. He said, while I was underneath that water, I saw his face. And Jesus' face is precious. I get pushed back from pastors. Why are you baptizing people two or three times? I go, well, the Lord just gave me a vision. I'm just trying to be obedient to that. He said, they say it's unscriptural. And I just go, well, I just know one prisoner in Texas that loves Jesus like he's never loved him before. And he got immersed in some water and Jesus encountered him. Let me show you what happened next. His life is so changed... that his new best friend is Melroy. <laughs> and there he is. The Aryan Nation racist is now the pastor of the prison, <laughs> laying hands on people. The local newspaper. Just remain standing, I'm done. I've got one last 30 second video. This is Big Robert. This is Big Robert. When I did an interview with him in, in, in the prison, this is Big Robert and um, Mel Roy, his new best friend. Make sure there's volume on this. Thumbs up. Are we good? Okay. The first of all, I love you because, you know, I've seen you grow into the man that you need to be and what God put you on this earth to be. Yes. And just as you say, you know, man, this is nothing, man. Yeah. You know, we, we the same. That's exactly right. We brothers. That's it. And I love you from the bottom of my heart, man. So thank you for allowing me to be here today. Let me encourage you. The eyes of the Lord roam throughout the whole earth. And what God's going to do in this last time is nameless and faceless. Seek his face. Cry out for his glory. And say, God, anything in my life that's offensive and grievous to you, I give you permission to expose it. I'm telling you, the greatest day of America is upon us. God's going to find some pastors who have been hiding. You're running 20 people. You're running 50 people. And nobody wants you to come preach. That's all right. That's all right. 
That does not what attract God to you. That, that does not attract God to you. He looks for the broken and the contrite heart. And he says, I will not refuse that. This is your finest hour. This is your moment. This is your season. You seize it. You love him. You go after him. Don't, do not measure your success based upon Western metrics of numbers. Gauge the success, the thickness and the depth of the weightiness of the glory of God in your sanctuary. Be the friend of God. Know him and know him well. May God bless you. Thank you, guys. Amen.